Well, this has been a very interesting week. I remember when I first invited Spencer Fernando on to come and talk about foreign policy just a few days ago that you know, I thought it was just going to be a boring episode. Not boring, but, you know, like very like focused episode talking about Justin Trudeau's attitudes and behavior on the world stage because of the India trip. But then when he got home, he absolutely shredded his own credibility and made the show far more interesting by randomly accusing the Indian government of potentially assassinating a Khalistani activist in Surrey, B.C., so I'm, I, I guess I have to thank Justin Trudeau for helping out the podcast, but it's great today to have both Daniel Boardman, another TNT contributor on this show, as well as Spencer Fernando guesting to talk about foreign policy, the most underrated uh, area of Canadian politics that I don't think enough people talk about. But before we get into some of the issues this week, I just wanted to maybe give Spencer the opportunity to introduce himself. You know, what, you know what's your website? What do you do? Maybe what a little bit of your background. Yeah, well, I uh, have a website, spencerfernando.com. I also write for the National Citizens Coalition. And uh, I used to be involved in party politics, you know, got involved in a few different political parties. Uh, I was relatively outspoken, which unless you're right at the top of political parties, they tend to not be uh, big fans of. So I got myself into trouble a few times. And then I thought, well, I may as well try to make a career out of, you know, sharing my opinions as opposed to getting fired for them. So I did that and it's worked out, uh, you know, decently well. And here I am. Well, you're... you're you're just like me then, because I got fired from the post millennial for sharing my opinions in a way that was slightly better than a different uh, than a different employee. There, I can say whatever I want. The the, the ownership is now changed to human events, so whatever. Uh, oh, and then I, wa- I just want to quickly like introduce Daniel because Daniel has been on fire the last couple of days when it comes to Indian media because since Justin Trudeau randomly decided to uh, whack Modi in the nose and and sort of, I guess, accuse like India of infiltrating Canada and just killing people it, because of uh, in like, because like Daniel actually knows a thing or two about Indian politics and Cal- this Calistani movement. Uh, he's been invited on pretty much every single uh, Indian news show over the past couple of days and basically become India's Tucker Carlson and Ben Shapiro at the same time. Anyways. Uh, yeah. Maybe you want to introduce yourself, Daniel, because I haven't been uploading as many videos from you on the channel for well, yes. Returning champion, welcome back. I am currently going viral in India. My phone is buzzing in my pocket for the last 48 hours. Uh, yeah, I've been I've been rambling about a lot of things, but I've been yelling into a void on the Khalistani issue for years now. Uh, no one seemed to care. Um, you know, I, I, I kind of went viral the first time in India back in the Article 370 thing before the pandemic. So uh, it, this isn't my first foray into, you know, Indian politics getting yelled at by Pakistan and, 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 and the like. But I just like, you know, I made some tweets, they, they did well. And then I just like woke up the one like yesterday morning, like pretty frustrated with how stupid this whole thing is. Like this is the worst foreign policy mistake. I, I, like I've, I've seen, I said since 2015, the Iran deal is just ridiculous. But this is the second worst thing I've ever seen. And I just like grabbed the coffee and I was just like 15 minutes like, all right. Blah, 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 blah. And then like that went viral in India. It has a million views. And then like I got on all these Indian like spaces and, and, and TV shows. And then like I went on with like, the Rachel Maddow of India, apparently. The first Indian TV interview I get is like with the most far left guy. I didn't know him, he didn't know me. He just brings me on and then like, oh, he's from Canada. And then I just like went hard and they're like, oh, uh, strong words, commercial break. But then like that went viral. He's like, everyone was like, it's like, you know, if if someone came on the CBC and like an Indian guy just came on the CBC and like told Rosemary Barton like, you know, oh, what's India like? Like we hate Trudeau, we hate Jagmeet and just like went super base. And, and like Rosemary Barton was like deer in headlights. That was like the Indian version of what happened. So that's been my life. Um, and I've been just ranting about Trudeau and trying to explain how silly Canada is to a billion people. Um, and they're loving it or terrified. I'm, I'm not sure. Some of them like it. Some of them are, are, are more terrified. But needless to say, Canada's not in a good geopolitical situation. And uh, we can get we can get into that and uh, and all that. But that that's my my origin story of the week is, yeah, I just I, I, I have producers of like every Indian TV show being like, this is the one white guy. Who knows what a Calistani is? Let's let's bring him on. Yeah, I only I only know about it from being from being a proxy to you, and then having you tell. Yeah, be one of the few people on the phone who, who will listen when I be like the Calistanians are this, and they made a video trying to kill everyone, and why will no one take it down? Yeah, that was that, that's that's how I learned about the Calistanians. Me just ranting about the videos they're making, and and why are we allowing this? So yeah. Well, anyways, the reason I kind of want to have Spencer on today, I wanted to kind of go back a little bit and start from Justin Trudeau's. In the initial trip at the G20, because that was kind of what the entire uh, podcast was going to be about. But I just wanted to get 
your guys' opinion as well as express my own opinion just about the way that Justin Trudeau has been kind of dealing with foreign policy and foreign affairs since he's taken office. Because although it's it's the it's the generic opinion to say he's silly, he's frivolous, he goes to he goes to India in 2018 and dresses up like a goof and then makes him like Canada look foolish. But a lot of people just don't understand the kind of very ideological, like the very ideological uh I guess, approach Justin Trudeau actually has to foreign policy. He's not a frivolous person. He actually has a specific ideological love for underdog groups in a certain sense. So that's where I feel like he'll just bring just Paul Atwal to India and not think it's a, a second about it because he just thinks that the Sikhs must I, be... I, you're right, but I think this this needs further explanation. For those who don't remember Jasper Atwal, this is the terrorist that Trudeau invited to India in 2018. This terrorist was convicted in a Canadian court of trying to assassinate an Indian political official. He was convicted in our court system, and we invited him to India. So if you understand why the Indians were talking about the threat of government enabling a Khalistani extremism, remember, if you think that's, oh, them just being right-wing, blustery, like, no, we literally invited a convicted Khalistani extremist who tried to kill one of their officials on an official visit. To, he tried to, to kill one of our own officials, too. He yeah. tried to kill the premier of uh, BC because he was an Indian who was, uh, or he was Sikh oh, yeah, who yeah, was right, anti Khalistan. Yeah, yeah. So it just so if you understand like where India's frustration builds up, um, you know, it, it's it's this where like we're 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 enabling in India's view we're enabling a hostile uh, foreign movement in the Khalistani movement, which is alive and well in Canada, but not in the Punjab region, which is where it's supposed to be. Um, so yeah, you you have this ridiculous thing, and and this is where India is so mad, and then and then you layer onto that the all the other foreign interference, and then trying to get out of it. The fact that Jagmeet Singh's in the coalition, he's banned from India. He's an ideological Khalistani. He's met with some extremists before. He's already concluded the investigation. Jag and Jagmeet's Jagmeet's figured out the culprit. Jagmeet's on a plane right now with handcuffs to bring Nader Modi to a Canadian jail. Like he's he's got he's got to the bottom of this. No more investigation. Jagmeet's found the culprit. It's the entire Indian government. He's coming for you. So yeah. I just, wanted to, I just wanted to jump over to you, Spencer. What, what would you say is maybe the kind of ideological frame that Justin Trudeau has when it comes to foreign policy? Or what is his kind of greatest weakness at the moment? In the sense, I don't think we could really point to any strengths other than trying to, I guess, make, make Panda more friendly with people we shouldn't be friendly with. Yeah, well, I think the, the big weakness uh, in terms of you know, the effect on the country is that he's you know, somewhat anti-Western in his outlook and he leads a Western country, right? So he leads a country that is, you know, should have, you know, values in common with the United States, with the United Kingdom, you know, Australia, the Anglo sphere. Um, but he he doesn't see that as a good thing. You know, he, he thinks Canada is a genocidal yeah. colonial estate. I mean, he said that he accused the country of committing an ongoing genocide while he was in power, which he think would make him you know, someone who's he, he called to crimes crimes, right? humanity publicly. Yeah. So he's basically accusing himself of being in charge of a genocidal state. And so, you know, as you say, he's a fan of underdog groups, but of course his view of underdog is, you know, the Chinese Communist Party, which is, you know, the biggest political organization on earth, a massive, ruthless, oppressive government. And so he has this, this kind of problem where strategically he obviously needs to govern Canada in a way that keeps us close to the United States, close to our traditional allies, but that's not really where his heart and his, uh, his mind is. And so you see this tension where you know, I'm not a big fan of Christia Freeland, but you get the sense that she's at least kind of pro-American, right? She's a pro-American Democrat, is somewhat reasonable in terms of her views. Trudeau's very, he's not at all like that, right? So there's a tension within the Liberal Party and the government itself. And again, you know, I'm sure we'll get into it, but you look at how quickly he was willing to jump on India. You know, the second he had anything he thought he could talk about, boom, he makes, says it in Parliament, makes it a huge international issue. Well, what about the, the two Chinese nationals kicked out of the, the microbiology lab? How come we haven't heard anything about that? He doesn't want to talk about that. doesn't want to talk about China at all. So I think people are noticing the uh, the discrepancy between how he handles you know Chinese foreign interference and then India. And maybe this is a good question for both of you to jump back and forth on. What do you think is more or is more heavily motivating Justin Trudeau right now when it comes to his approach? to uh, just foreign policy and especially now this India issue. Is it political motives, domestic political motives, or is it just purely we're just seeing how how he would like to interact on the world stage of sort of picking winners and losers based on ideological favor and whatnot, not actual, you know, long-term, uh, you know, alliances and uh, demonstrations that you're an actual, like, good ally? 
Yeah. I mean, so, I mean, I've, I've tried to answer this question all day. Everyone asks this. Like, how, explain Justin Trudeau's decision making, essentially. You can't. You cannot explain Justin Trudeau's decision making here. There is no rhyme or reason to be doing what he's doing. Maybe it's personal vendetta. Maybe, you know, you know, uh, the Calistanis are, are running the show. Who, who knows? But none of this makes any sense. He's put us in the worst position we've ever seen. Like, if you want to start a, a geopolitical fight with someone, okay. Now, try not to start them with your allies. So Canada is allied with India. We're starting a fight with a geopolitical ally with lots of power, a billion people. We only hedge against China that possibly exists in the world. And we share similar alliances. We're both from the Commonwealth. So the UK, the US, Australia. When we accuse India of being a threat to Western democracies through extrajudicial assassinations, that's a big claim. And you, if you want other countries to take your side and, you know, back them and force the Indians to apologize and do a thing and maintain trade deals, you need to come with some evidence. You need to come with a smoking gun. If you're going to kick an Indian diplomat out, right? Remember how hard it was for us to get him to kick the Chinese diplomat out who had threatened Michael Chong's family? So before the investigation concluded, we got a diplomat coming out and, and we got this. So logically, the Americans and the Australians asked, why? Why should we back you? And Trudeau said, yo, trust me, bro. And then they were like, no, we're not cutting ties with India based on, on your word. So the Australians told us to chill out. The Americans want to see more um, evidence. Peter wants to see more evidence. And, and that's the reasonable thing. It's like no one's going to back Canada, a country of 40 million people, against a country of a billion people based on the word of Justin Trudeau and some intelligence report when he just spent the last month attacking the intelligence agencies for trying to report on the Chinese interviews. So I, this is industrial level gaslighting on the, by the liberal government. And and can I explain their motivations? No. Do you want to think like Justin Trudeau? Ram your head into a wall 15 times and then, you know, take a microphone and see what comes out. Like, that's 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 all I can offer you. you one thing I was going to quickly just say before I jump back over to Spencer is that it was funny on the first day when Trudeau announced this, that there was potentially an extrajudicial killing and, like, India is heavily suspected. Polyev and the Conservatives were willing to come out on that day and say, well, this is awful. If it's true, blah, blah, blah. No Canadian should ever be killed on Canadian soil, even though he apparently isn't a Canadian, but then I've seen other reports that say he apparently is. So uh, but, Miller like, came out and said he's been a Canadian since 2007 now. Okay. Well, anyways, but since the, since yet, yeah, like, but then yesterday, Polly have felt confident enough to come back out and say, well, where's the evidence? And I guarantee if you're the opposition leader and there was evidence, you would have been shown right away. Unless like, you know, Justin Trudeau, which I don't think he's capable of, is playing 3D chess and trying to bait out Polly Evan to saying it's not real and then giving all the evidence. I think that it's just not there. But anyways, but yeah, Spencer, what do you think is Trudeau's motivation here? Well, I think, you know, I think um, with the conservatives, I think what happened was, I think Paul Ayub was kind of pressured almost, you know, I think Trudeau went to him at the last minute and said, hey, look at this, you know, Canadian citizen was killed by India, this is terrible, I'm going to go make an announcement. And then so kind of pressures Paul Ayub to have to say something, right? So you notice he kind of changed a little bit. He It's like he had a, he, he slept on it, got up and was like, wait a minute, this, this was, this is moving a little bit quick, you know, let's see some evidence. And Trudeau himself, it's interesting, he toned down his rhetoric a lot the second day, he wonder if he had a few calls with the US and the UK or somebody. But in terms of motivation, I think part of it is that it's it's Trudeau's own ideology and that it mixes with domestic politics, right? I mean, there's a big, obviously, voter base in Canada of Chinese Canadians, many of whom, of course, are not fans of the Chinese Communist Party, but some, of course, who are. And so Trudeau has found that he could both be pro-China, which is ideologically you know, where he wants to be, and he could get some votes from it. And same with the issue of, you know, supporting, you know, he doesn't openly support the Calistan movement, but obviously very friendly towards it with his rhetoric and what happens in the country. And so that also works because there's a lot of people in the country who, who support that. So he can get votes that way. So it's a bit of that going on. But I think it's also just, you know, you look at his father. His father was a big fan of Fidel Castro. His father was a big fan of the Chinese Communist Party at the most ruthless moment. I mean, he was a fan of the Chinese Communist Party when Mao was in power and killing millions of people. And so I think that's just who Trudeau is. That's That's just what he believes. That's how he thinks. And so, you know, he sometimes he's able to suppress it when he gets pressure from the U.S. or other allies or when there's pressure from his own caucus. But I think overall, he just always drifts back towards a very pro-China, anti-Western, anti-India position. And that's what we're seeing again. Yeah, I think that's one thing that this seems to be tracking very closely to is the way that Justin Trudeau, and this is where I'm going to go back to the G20 and why I think that even sans this whole uh, accusation of murder thing. I think that what Trudeau messed up on when he went to India at the G20 is not just his previous trip in 2018 where he brings a convicted terrorist with him, 
but at, but what he really messed up on at this G20 event was that he thought he could do the same thing he did to the Polish prime minister as well as the uh, Italian prime minister, Giorgio Maloney, where he went in and basically, you know, pointed his finger at them, said, you guys aren't good enough on social issues. You guys aren't progressive like me. And he was thinking that he could maybe win some inter uh, points with the Canadian media and the international press by being this very loud, outspoken, progressive uh, leader who's going to take it to all these social conservatives. So I think in India, he was going to see if he could maybe bring up this this uh, idea that the Indian government might have killed a uh, Sikh uh, individual in Canada and like, you know, you put, put his finger in Modi's chest and said, well, you guys got to do better. See, all the things I've done to you aren't nearly as bad when I've thrown this little pe accusation at you. So I think it's a lot of what Justin Trudeau has been doing on the international stage feels like a reactionary response to the fact that he's losing popularity and that he needs to find some sort of external enemy that he can have a fight with and maybe accuse the conservatives of not properly backing up their own country with they don't end up backing him up. Um, but maybe now we should sort of talk a little bit about sort of who this Hardeep Singh uh, Nijar guy is, as well as why the Khalistani movement is so such a big deal in Canada, because I think a lot of people are probably thinking, why are we talking about international politics in Canada? There's, I, I see comments all the time. They're like, why, why are we even discussing this? And a lot of people just don't quite understand about how much of a hub that uh, that uh, Canada has become for different extremist groups, including the Khalistani movement. But I think that that's probably a good thing for you to end up explaining, Daniel. Yeah, I mean, how did we get here? Um, you know, quick background: like this all kicked up in the 1980s. If you feel politics 101, uh, India, Pakistan, not friends. Uh, so in the 80s, the Pakistanis sort of funded this Khalistani movement that was, you know, doing violence all over India. Um, now it's good to like, and the point of the, when we say Khalistan, the Khalistanis are advocating for a separate uh, region, uh, Sikh state carved off from India in the Punjab region. So that's on the India Pakistan border. Uh, in 1984, there was like Operation Blue Star, where they took these terrorists out of a, a but they held up in, in, the, in the Sikh holy site. They took them out. There was Sikh people involved in Operation Blue Star from the Indian government side. Uh, then Indra Gandhi was assassinated by two Sikh, her two Sikh bodyguards. This started anti-Sikh riots across the country. And like this was the, the framework of the 1980s. And then uh, internationally in Canada, um, when the World Sikh Organization was found, they're going to kill 50,000 Hindus. And they start promising planes will fall from the skies. What happened to Canadian plane Air India? Uh, 182 fell from the sky, uh, blown up by the, the, a Khalistani terrorist sect in Canada. One guy was convicted. The others uh, all walked. The judge threw out the testimonies of people who testified against the group because they didn't testify in person because they were assassinated uh, before they could testify. So they, he threw out their affidavits. Insane. Absolutely insane. So from that point on, we've been enabling the growth of Khalistanis by just not really showing any consequences, kind of ignoring it. There's been on Gudwars who have put out like hit lists on on Indian politicians and policemen. There's been uh, posters of glorious martyrs who who assassinated these people in some of these radical Khalistani mosques, and and this is is picked up. So you know the the number one concern for Canadians here is like, like domestic ethnic violence, right? You have groups of radicals promising ethnic violence against another group in Canada. You can't have that. You can't have. I've seen these Khalistani mobs harass Hindus. It, it, it's not good. Uh, and then on the other end, for everyone else, well, a lot of the Khalistanis, especially, have been involved in organized crime. Like, this is just another open secret thing we're not talking about. Oh, Hardeep Singh Nanter was killed. He's a Khalistani leader, Sikh leader. It's like, I don't, like, listen, I don't I don't know anything about him or his family or whatever, but as equally likely, let's say, as this being a clandestine assassination by the Indian government to take out this one random guy in Canada, it could be equally as likely that this could be turf war gang violence between these, these different rival factions in Canada because the Calistanis have gotten into a lot of the organized crime here because, you know, you give a bunch of extremist young men th things to do and it, it, it's not... The fact that they're also involved in organized crime tends to be a piece, good piece of evidence that the vast majority of the Sikh community does not support them uh, yeah. financially because they don't want to get involved. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, like, this, this, there, there's this myth I've seen a lot, on, especially in India, like, oh, this vote bank politics. That's true. It's trying to get all the Sikhs. It's like, if you actually look at, like, Stephen Harper did an excellent job growing the Sikh base in the Conservative Party. And he did it without the Calisandis. He just went to Sikh communities, talked to them like regular human beings, gave them the con conservative spiel, which is individual rights, liberty, you came for a better thing, you know, lower taxes, families, whatever. And, and this worked on Sikh people because it works on, uh, on a lot of people. And, 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 you know, the involvement of Sikhs in, in conservative politics really took off. So you can get the Sikh vote 
without going to these radical gurdwaras. So we're not. So it's a, the Sikh vote is actually not cal- concentrated in these Khalistanis. Now maybe there's more money in the Khalistanis. Maybe they have more access to political funding, and that's more important. Like this, this could be another thing. But in terms of like you can, yeah, we, yeah, and the Khalistani movement isn't a top of mind of every Canadian. And if you're not a Hindu Indian, I get why. Like they're not coming after you. But the, these are problems, and if you leave them unaddressed for decades, as we've done, well, they can start meta- metastasize. And then you get more Khalistanis in government. And then you get Jagmeet Singh. And then you get to this thing where you have the Prime Minister of Canada, who I think Spencer's right, listening to his own political ideology. I think there's a bunch of lefties, anti-India, anti-Western people in the Liberal Party as well. I think there's some adults, but I don't think Trudeau's the only Trudeau there. And then, you know, he just starts taking pot shots in India without thinking of the consequences. And, and now Canada's in a major diplomatic spat. We might be on the outs with our allies because we've allowed this Khalistani movement to fester and grow in our country. So, yeah, it didn't really affect any non-Hindu people for 30 years or so, but now it does. Now it affects all of us. And this is a failure of, of Canadian society to address serious issues. And, and so, like, and this, is an, uh, this is kind of from my perspective, but it almost kind of feels like, especially when you contrast it uh, with the way that Justin Trudeau dealt with the CCP in Canada, with all the interference issues, that it almost feels as if he's almost trying to intentionally build up China, be soft on them, and be harder on India, because he wants to have this kind of, uh, I guess, like, either either he wants China to be more powerful than India, or he wants them to basically always be stuck at a deadlock because of his maybe crazy equity kind of a uh, mindset. Uh, and maybe, Spencer, you'd want to answer that of what do you kind of think? Do you think he's trying to undermine India or is this more of like an, a specific just ideological thing? Again, I know you kind of already said it's mostly ideological, but in the in the context of India and trade issues, uh, it felt like it's almost intentional of Trudeau nuking a trade deal. Yeah, well, I think it's also, uh, you know, political survival for him and the liberals. I think, you know, you have to kind of read between the lines, you know, if the liberals, they, they were, they've been getting absolutely just killed on, you know, blocking the you know, inquiry and how they're obviously afraid of talking about Chinese, you know, foreign interference. If they had an easy answer to it, they could have eased the political pressure and helped themselves to the polls by just saying, okay, we're going to have an inquiry, we're going to look into it. The fact that they don't want to do that tells you that there's a lot that they know. If people look into it, they're going to look pretty terrible. But now what they can say is, oh, well, we're just having a broad look at, you know, foreign interference. It's not just a China issue. Oh, it's India. It's really a big problem. I mean, Jagmeet Singh obviously wants to do that. He already sent a letter, uh, you know, to the the person leading the inquiry saying, oh, you have to look at uh, India as well. And so he's just, they're just going to muddy the waters and say, oh, well, it's not a China specific problem. You know, every country's interfering. India's interfering. It's an equal problem. And just hope that most people, you know, Canadians will look at it and say, well, eh, it looks like every country's trying to screw with our elections, whatever. It's just a big mess. Who knows? You know, they'll say, oh, look, Harper's promoting the IDU, which has become kind of the left for the left, right? The IDU apparently controls every conservative part in the world. Uh, so the, the conspiracy for the left. Uh, but they'll just muddy the waters, try to make the issue go away. And um, Jagmeet Singh obviously wants to help the, with that. Uh, do you think they also just want to drag out an investigation into India and they don't actually want to get to the bottom of it? And this is going to be one of those kind of boogeymen that can always be behind the scenes? Because I know there's already leftist media going after uh, Shubh Majumdar, who just entered parliament because he happens to be t- decently supportive of you know, Modi's more aggressive stance on extremist groups and whatnot. Yeah, they're going to play politics with it, obviously, and they're going to, I mean, it's, you know, again, I think they're very scared of the links they have with China, having that investigated. And so I think if they can make it look like it's just a big problem with every country interfering, and obviously they'll talk about Russia, the United States. I mean, I've even seen liberals saying, oh, we have to talk about foreign interference from the United States, as if there's some sort of, you know, ethical or moral link between America interfering in Canada and, you know, a country like China or Russia. But uh, yeah, they're just gonna they're just gonna try to muddy the waters. It's, it's just enough for their partisans to say that it's you know it's not a liberal problem, and that's what they've been trying to do from the beginning. To say and, and say it's a is not a liberal problem issue. because conservatives yeah. are saying this is ridiculous. So we mm-hmm. conservatives don't take foreign interference so seriously. The yeah. liberals do because they're going hard. Their trust and has been the most uh, stringent and, and proactive on foreign interference. Look, he kicked out an Indian diplomat before even reading a piece of paper. Yeah. I, I think this is a, I think this is a big part of what's going on here. I just want to break it down a little bit further because if you read and you kind of read in between the lines of what's going on, especially the travel ban uh, or the travel advisory to India, this reeks of, this was written by radical extremists 
um, ideologues in his thing. And it was, and I, and I mean all of them, lefties, Islamists, communists, Calistanis, because the travel advisor to India, like, unless you know kind of what's going on here, it, it mentions a travel advisory for Kashmir and that region, not the Punjab. So if Harjip Sinajar was assassinated by India and it's unsafe to go to Canada and because of all this violence, that would be in the Punjab region. That's where the Khalistan issue is. The Kashmiri issue, that's not Khalistan. That's not Sikhs. That's Hindus versus Muslims. Like, so to call it like this, this shot at, at the Kashmiri sovereignty in India, this reeks of like his Taria wrote this. So it's not even the right region. And, and the area they're harping on is like a, it, it just reeks a, a, of, of Pakistani, you know, uh, military press release um, about it's now unsafe, undermining their, their claims to Kashmir. So it's not even the right region, which means even the person who wrote the travel advisory doesn't know where India is on a map. But the more likely thing is they know exactly where India is on a map. They know exactly what the problems are in India and misidentified the problem regions to give further um, political uh, clout to, you know, the Pakistan's, Hizb um, you know, uh, his, uh, and, and Jamaati Islamis in the Kashmir region. So you read what they're even saying, and it has nothing to do with really anything we're talking about. If you understand what they're saying, like they're talking about Kashmir now, the Canadian government, just throwing shots there. Like it's so clear that there are anti-India ideologues, like hard left ideologues, whether, I don't know, whether it's communist, Islamist, CCP, Khalistani, whatever it is, it's so clear that, that they have some hand in what the liberals are doing here, because if you know anything about India, or if you have a, a decent understanding of Indian politics, it, it just what can it, it's just make none of it makes any sense. To, to, to throw throw something into you uh, for you again, like or just go back to when Ramnish Sangha basically blew the whistle on how many Kalistanis were literally in the cabinet of the Liberal Party and in caucus, and he ended up being literally having his life threatened and couldn't walk into a Tim Hortons without bodyguard yeah, walking in and checking it out before him. So Ramnish Sangha is a Liberal MP. Um, he former. was kicked out of the Liberal Party. He was kicked out of the Liberal Party for being, he's a Sikh guy who would raise the issue of Calistanis in the Canadian government. He even claimed, you know, that high-ranking Liberal cabinet official, officials were Calistanis sympathizers. And I know which ones he's talking about. Um, but uh, if you talk to Ra Ra Rami Sangha, like you, this, there was stories like, yeah, he, he would have security go in, in like Brampton and Mississauga, to like GTA area, would go south, suss out like anywhere he walked in, Tim Hortons, just to make sure that it was safe for him. That's a Canadian Liberal Sikh guy. So... You know, the, and this again, this is all before this uh, the, the killing of Harjip Singh Najib. So it's this has been a, a, a long standing issue in this community and, it, and it's not going away. And even when liberal Sikh MPs step up to criticize, it wasn't enough to stop it. He got kicked out of the party for it. Yeah. And this is where I kind of want to bring this to a, a slightly different topic. And this is actually the original reason I've been really wanting uh, Spencer on to do a podcast with us, because I think this all comes back to the idea that foreign policy does matter and that by just sort of ignoring foreign policy and foreign affairs and thinking that everything outside of your own country is not your issue and just sort of lock down, don't really get, don't really care what's going on. You're and you're going to end up hitting a lot of these landmines that Justin Trudeau is now running into because being ideological and being consistent with yourself is not always actually going to mesh with the rest of the world. Canada should always, of course, enforce its own interests. But right now, you cannot just play ideological games on the world stage and you also can't ignore the you can also can ignore the world either and so this is also something that's been really taking over the both the populist left and populist right the idea that canada shouldn't have anything to do with any other foreign country and that we can just sort of do our own thing and that it's somehow a violation of you know canada's interests to even discuss or support uh, allies and i think that we are now seeing that when you do not respect allies like india you could have massive economic uh, like massive economic sort of like issues there because of trade deals being killed and then having to rely more heavily on China, which is of course a threat to our national security. But maybe if I can, you know, put this into a frame of a question, like uh, Spencer, what do you what do you think's been kind of the more toxic uh, development in uh, in in foreign policy? Has it been more of the kind of uh, ideological leftism, internationalism, or has it been more of kind of like populist isolationism? Well, I mean, both have had their drawbacks, but I think isolationism has become the real problem. I mean, what you have, you have people who unfortunately are almost unable to, you know, see any nuance in issues, right? You know, is it a problem that 
Um, you know, the U.S. countries like Canada deindustrialized and shipped so much pr production manufacturing to China. Obviously, does that mean that we should have nothing to do with any other country and just let authoritarian states run rampant and do whatever they want? Obviously not, right? But that's a nuance that's lost, unfortunately, a lot of people. And you know, there's this weird. It's 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 not just in Canada. You see it in in other countries too. But you know, people they're so almost insulated from the world or feel they're so insulated from the world that they think that whatever is happening has something to do completely with them or that they could just exempt themselves from it right so i see a lot of people be like oh well you know russia what russia wants to do has nothing to do with me you know i don't want war well, war's got nothing to do with me it's like well that's not how the world works you know if an authoritarian state wants war then you have war whether you want it or not you know i'm just going to opt out of this you know world war ii you know i'm just not i'm not just not feeling this i'm just going to opt out i don't want to be involved in world war ii you know that's france just not how the time out. what if france yeah. just called time out yeah, just Good pause, time. you know, pause, reassess your strategy. And so it's just, it's this kind of attitude. And it's, I think some of it is a bit of a fear response too. I think people think that if they somehow rhetorically ally with the scariest countries like China and Russia, that somehow they'll be saved from it, right? You see that with the, on the left and the right, you know, the people who are very pro-Russia or pro-China as if you think that's going to save you. You think, you, you know, Putin talks about how much he wants the West to fall, how much he hates the West. Russian officials are always saying how much he hates the West. Do the people who support him in Canada and the states think that he's going to exempt them from the supposed destruction of the West he wants to bring about? I mean, that's just not how it works. And so there's there's a lot of people who are naive. And then I think, especially for Canada, you know, we're we're just so lucky that we have the U.S. as as our top ally. I mean, the U.S. they basically have to defend North America whether we do or not because it's in their interest to do so. So we just don't spend anything on our military. You know, we don't have much of an impact around the world. We lecture them from time to time. Oh, how come you guys don't have great social programs? Well, maybe because they're spending $800 billion a year on their military, much of which they have to spend because their allies don't choose to spend an equivalent amount as a percentage of well, GDP. Plus, you put heavy air quotes around great social programs. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, not, yeah. I mean, it, the Europeans say the same thing too, right? They lecture the U.S. about social programs, and then, you know, they say, oh, the U.S. has to deploy 100,000 troops to protect them from Russia. And so I think there's just this attitude of Canadians have been so, um, so lucky to have the U.S. as a neighbor. And so we haven't had many conflicts on our own soil. And so people just kind of assume that that's just going to continue forever. We're just magically protected. The world's just fine if we think it's fine. And uh, it's a very dangerous attitude. Well, and people have this, people almost take their, and it's not even like a Canadian context kind of a thing, because if you took the Canadian political context into account, you might have more nuanced take on it. But people apply foreign policy to like a Republican versus Democrat in the U.S. kind of a battle. That This is the thing that me and Daniel have even gotten, and of course you have, because I always watch your Twitter feed, uh, Spencer, <laughs> that you always get flack for saying like, hey, I think... Of Vladimir Zelensky is kind of a clown. I think he needs to put a suit back on. I think he needs to stop basically asking for money without actual goals to what they're going to achieve in Ukraine. Also, I don't support Russia because Russia is an awful authoritarian state. It's not a trad Western state where everyone's <laughs> where everyone's thin reading the Bible and you know getting married at 25 and having 10 kids. It's not that country. It's a country where they stopped tracking alcoholism rates because it kept getting worse. That's not. It's not a fantastic place to live. But you get people who think that because I have issues with Ukraine, because I don't think maybe they're getting too much money, maybe I don't like the military goals, maybe that they should be finding an off ramp to make peace in the region because they can't fight this war for 10 years because it's just not going to end in anything positive. That if you think that any of those thoughts, well, then you must think that somehow Putin's secretly the good guy. And this is always the thing that that drives me up the wall whenever you end up talking about foreign policy. Because the funny thing, and I think you guys will agree, is the same sort of very populist right person or the person who's a populist in the Green Party, because, you know, don't don't be fooled. The Green Party is actually very supportive of Russia when you actually talk to the, the them individually, that the same that that Justin Trudeau's approach to foreign policy is actually the populist rights approach to foreign policy in slightly inversed in the sense that instead of being pro Russia or being kind of thinking that maybe Russia secretly in the right, maybe they've been bullied. Justin Trudeau is the same guy thinking maybe China has been bullied by the United States and, and India and maybe that we need to be doing some things to prop them up. It's incredibly low IQ ways of thinking about foreign policy. And this is why I think that needs to be way more education around the issue where people don't just say, you know, neocon warmonger every single time. You That's my favorite thing, by the way, kids, you kids out there, if you ever get called a neocon on Twitter, that means, you know, foreign policy. If, so, if, if, a, if if some absolute moron calls you a neocon, it means you just got something right. 
You just you just got something right, and people are throwing a temper tantrum. You you know my theory on 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 this. I I, I gave the term reflexive contrarianism. This is what I see it as. And this is left and right. Like you see people go like, oh, the media supports Ukraine. And part of your thing is you don't like the mainstream media. They lied to you about COVID. They lied to you about your personal issue. They lied to you about this. So you don't trust them. And then all of a sudden they take position A. So you're going to take position B, right, just to oppose them. And then it goes on the same thing, right? When Donald Trump was president and he supported uh, or he said that murdering innocent Iranians was bad, Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer stood up to him and said, no, we're not going to condemn you condemn the the IRGC for openly admitting to murdering innocent civilians and because Trump had so we're just going to take the opposite position I think oppositionalism and contrarianism is driving a lot of foreign policy discourse and it's, it's not good because no one's really thinking on principle and to think on foreign policy is much different than domestic policy it takes it's, it's a bit of a, a different brain here so like you know domestic policy is one thing but on the foreign policy issue like the meta of this is as we laid it at the beginning you're starting a fight with an ally you need to win over alliances. Like, how do you get the Americans? How do you get the Europeans? How do you get the Australians? How do you get the rest of the world on your side here? Because India has leverage because they have a billion people. And we have 40 million people, right? So you have, to, you have to figure out these different leverages. And to an extent, does the truth even matter, right? If India did commit this assassination, well, the only thing that really matters in foreign policy is can you prove it? And if you cannot prove it, then you should not even try because you're standing to lose more than you can gain. And... You know, if you and if you can prove it, well, then you have to provide the proof. Trudeau's done neither of that. So, you know, yeah, you're right. Like, it, 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 it people can just say, oh, all our money should be going to Canada, and why are we doing other things? It's like, well, do you want a pizza to cost less than forty five dollars a slice? Do you, like, do you want to buy a pizza for less than fifty dollars? And the answer is yes, because you need global trade. So we have to trade with America. We have to trade with Mexico. We have to trade with the Europeans. We have to give them canola. They have to give us this, and, and this is all intricate stuff. You start fights with India and you make people really mad. People start choosing sides. Supply chains start getting smaller. Prices start going up. And then all of a sudden, this is domestic. So solid governance of foreign policy is really important because these mess ups can create cataclysmic geopolitical events that affect domestic food prices, energy supplies, um, you know, outright wars can start because of it. So if foreign policy is a bit hard to make people care about because it doesn't affect them until it really affects them. And it's, it's hard to make people proactive. I think people also have to realize that foreign policy in of itself, like all other issues, usually the truth in a foreign policy topic is far more boring than you would actually expect. It is it is boring trade deals, legal agreements and stuff like that. And to a certain extent, that's a good thing. That means things are functioning normally. Yet, and this is the thing that really drives me up the wall when you sort of follow Twitter discourse around foreign policy is and you, Spencer, you've gotten this on you've gotten this on the chin before from the populist crowd, is that everything becomes like basically just whatever you think is the spiciest, most interesting explanation for something. That's why. So Spencer is a big old idiot because he doesn't believe in bio labs starting the Ukraine war and stuff like that. And Vladimir Zelensky's wife has spent a billion dollars on dresses or something like that. And that's what all the money is going towards. And if you don't believe any of this stuff, then you must be just a small brain person. But again, this is the way the left and the right on the populist right, the fringes, tends to think about foreign policy issues. And that like, you know, Israel must deserve Hamas launching rockets because there's this video that's heavily edited showing someone getting shot by like by like Israeli security forces. And then there's like, you know, Ukraine had a very nice country sitting next to Russia. Obviously, they wanted to be attacked kind of stuff. But like, what do you think is like you think that social media has definitely like uh, added to the uh, the push of like bad information when it comes to foreign policy? To an extent, I mean, you see these narratives that are just completely incoherent. I mean, you know, anti-Semitism is obviously the worst of it, right? It's like somehow, you know, the same people who control the world also had half their population killed, you know, in World War II, right? I mean, that doesn't seem to make much sense, you know? And then you look at uh, Ukraine. So the money we're giving to Ukraine is simultaneously uh, making World War III about to happen because Russia's being, you know, degraded. But it's also not being used at all, and it's all being laundered and stolen by Zelensky, apparently, right? So it's simultaneously doing too much to help Ukraine, and it's all being stolen. And so, you know, you see people pushing these narratives, but I think there's there's kind of a, a deeper issue, which is that I think you're seeing a, a loss of, you know, faith and democracy on, on the far left and the far right, and it's kind of inching into yeah. you know, a little bit into the center as well. 
And everyone's kind of looking for, you know, the cheat code to just get what they want without going through the messy process of having to debate and actually win elections. So I think for a lot of people on the right, that's what Russia was, right? It was like, oh, well, here's big, strong man Putin, you know, you know, traditionalist Putin, pro-family, you know, kidnapping thousands of Ukrainian children. Not the most profoundly, but of course, that's the image he presents. And a lot of people are fools and they fall for the image of dictators. Oh, they look so strong. Oh, there's no opposition, of course, because they're killing people and suppressing people. Look at all these but, young, attractive people mm -hmm. dancing with Russian yeah. flags. Isn't this like... Must be the whole country. That, the whole country must one, be like that. Yeah. That one I hate the most because they'll show a bunch of Ukrainians on like the sea at some oh, sort of random oh, yeah. place. They're like, look at these people partying or yeah. whatever. they like, <laughs> or look at all these it. people being mm -hmm. cringe. Isn't there a war going on? They realize that people like, you know, people had tea in their parlors and, you know, went out to parties during World War II as How well. Keep calm like, the the entire country's not being yeah. bombed all at once. But, but no, if Russians are dancing at a nightclub and also t taking part in, you know, indulging their alcoholism, then sanctions then are failing. Yeah, yeah, sanctions are failing. Yeah. Look how great they are. Like they're not at war. There's no, 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 no problem in Russia. See how good they're dancing. They're going, yeah, it's, it's, it's these people it's all, I, I, I assume that these people also don't clap whenever they see videos of like Laurentian elite kids at a party, like dancing. They're like, Ken is doing so well. <laughs> yeah, it, it's such selective uh, misappropriate outrage. And like, yeah, and we, we live in a time where I think I think Spencer made the point, like, or you made the point, like, you try and take a nuanced view on this, and like the lefties who know nothing about foreign policy will start to say, Russia, Putin supporter, or Putin this. It's like, dude, I was such a Russia hawk. I was I was actually against the Russian invasion of Ukraine in 2014 when it was totally cool. Remember when Obama was president and we we're all just totally cool with Russia invading Ukraine, except for me and like the rest of us, like except for the people who are still anti-Russia. So yeah, getting- Don't you realize, Daniel, it was a CIA coup in Ukraine. Oh, a CIA coup. And they paid, oh, and they paid oh, millions oh, of Ukrainians oh, individually. Oh, the All CIA Ukrainians made me do it. Oh, the, the CIA is in my brain. Now I'm gonna, oh, Ukraine exists. It's That's like okay. it's like in Iran, like oh, the 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 CIA plot against Mossadegh. That's they must have paid every single Iranian and Ukrainian to get out on the streets to protest their terrible Guys, government. The, the neural link chip has malfunctioned. I just want to. It's, it's true. Ukraine isn't real. There is no Ukraine. There is no war. There's a well, people think they're being run. forced to fight. Oh, America's forcing them to fight, right? So, America's oh yeah, America's forcing people to you know stand up for their country and go to the front lines and you know die in relatively large numbers. Interesting. America has that power. If they did have that power, maybe they could just end the war immediately, right? It's just, it's just, but th this is what's so disturbing about it is, is the incoherence of it that should be obvious to people as they're making these arguments. And then you, you explain it to them and it's like, okay, so as you say, reflexive contrarianism, right? It's like, so you've chosen not to believe the Canadian government and the Canadian media, fine. But then you're aligning with someone, Vladimir Putin, who has a much more repressive media apparatus and just silences opponents completely. So all the things you supposedly dislike about Canadian media and the Canadian government, yeah. far worse in an authoritarian state, but that's who they side with. And you explain it to people and they're just like, oh, well, no, you're just uh, sure repeating the well, narrative. So, I think it's part of like they want to be think they think they're critical thinkers. So mm -hmm. by being like, I can see through the media's bullshit because I'm so smart. Like I saw through COVID, I saw through this. Like I when they said lied about the conflict. And like it's true, the Canadian mainstream media does lie and misrepresent things. I watched it. I've called out times where I've, I've said, here, they're actively mistranslating Farsi. They use one of the five Farsi phrases I understand and they're mistranslating it here. And, and, and like I say, oh, and I've done things like, here's where they're mis... We've all shown where, but it's not 100% false. Like that's the problem. Like CNN isn't 100% false. It's there's some truth yeah. and then a bit of a spin. There's and, yet the nuance. Yeah, but like so when you try and say like okay, I, I reject the the sort of narrative coming out of the CBC, which I do too. Like I don't think they did a great job covering Ukraine. Like why didn't I talk about this in the beginning? Like they were missing a lot of the major points. Um, but then like you know I, I'm like no Russia the bad guys. So you make like no one happy here. These people just want an easy digestible take and like again it's these people think they're critical thinkers i can think through all the media stuff but then they get russian propaganda they're like look see evans what's your evidence sputnik like russia today like you're like oh the canadian means to me lies and then they're like here's 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 an article directly from vladimir putin uh about why vladimir putin is right and you're like don't tell me you're a critical thinker if you're just like yeah okay you can see through the here's canadian the funny thing great Here's the funny thing with the Ukraine issue, too. And this is where people get it wrong. And this is where you get a lot of almost like populist soothsayers just trying to interpret what they think other people believe about foreign policy. Trump was actually a very hawkish foreign, uh, like uh, hawkish on foreign policy as a president overall. Like, you know, 
like bombing Qasem Soleimani, rocketing him, killing him. He heavily increased funding towards Ukraine, the uh, lap, uh, the uh, Eastern Bloc countries, uh, Georgia. He gave way more funding to them to try and stave off invasions. And the reason that Ukraine was able to hold on when the invasion first started was because they had an increased supply of weapons from the Trump administration, which the Biden administration immediately cut as soon as they came into government, just like Obama had. And then they only ramped it up when the invasion started. It's, but people don't really ever remember this kind of stuff because that's, you know, memory is difficult and whatnot. But, uh, but, the, the, but like, and the thing is, again, people are always, people don't realize that the, it's not that people think that it's, it's almost like this is, a, I, I wrote this in an article actually recently. It wasn't an article, but it was like an essay for like my master's program. Uh, what, you guys are going to have to save me on this one. I have to go figure out what this, uh, what this word is. Daniel, you're in. Sorry, you're cutting out a bit. What, what's the word? Oh, no, no, no. I have to think of the word. That's why you're saving me here. Um, the word of the day is, um, you know, anti-disestablishmentarianism. That... Almost. I just remembered it. Okay, it was Gnosticism. The people oh. have this very Gnostic view of politics, and it, and it goes to both foreign policy and domestic policy. That if they go inside their own heads enough and they think enough, they're going to get, like, divine foreign policy revelation, and they're going to know what's going on. There is, And this is the thing is, it's in mainstream media, too. It's not just, like, you know, weird crackpot blogs. This is what mainstream media does as well. Because even they, on this whole Modi issue are pretending to know what the motivations of the Indian government and Modi would be. And they're just taking Justin Trudeau's word for it. And then just creating a narrative that makes it sound about plausible. Yeah, pretty much that's Canadian yeah. journalism 101. Yeah. And there is, there's a, there's a, a cult of personality aspect to it as well, right? Like, uh, yeah. you know, Trump is the, the peace president to his supporters now somehow, which is interesting. Um, but his supporters also loved when he took out uh, Soleimani, which I, I love. Like right? that. Right? Yeah, it was a good that move. But his, supporters were, his supporters were like, oh, this is awesome. You know, he's throwing up the gang signs, you know, tweets out the, the American flag after doing it, right? People love yeah. that. But then the, and if Trump flipped on Ukraine and said, actually, no, I oppose Russia now. We need to help Ukraine. His supporters would be like, yeah, Trump is based. This is awesome, right? So people are just the same with Trudeau, right? I mean, Trudeau could flip it. His supporters go all over the place. It's just personality cults. But, you know, back to the, the issue of democracy, I think I think we're seeing a real a real problem, the lack of... Uh, understanding of how democracy works with you know our own citizens and across the western world and you know i, I look at this and you, you look at how people it's you can see it both with ukraine and the united states and with israel a lot of the critics of those countries their criticisms are basically just on the fact that they're relatively free societies right so people look at israel oh, look at all the people protesting in israel well yeah that's because they're allowed to protest why do you not see the same things in iran or when you do see them a bunch of people are getting you know massacred in the streets but people just say they just keep falling for it over and over again. Well, China, look at they're so organized. Look at this Chinese city where they put all their money into, where they put propagandists everywhere. Oh, it looks they so much better than America. America. Yeah, America's yeah. a mess. America's divided. America's falling apart. That's what democracies look like. That's what countries with open media look like. And people, even in those countries, keep falling for it. Like, oh, if we were just authoritarian, if if my group got into power and my dictator was in power, everything would be fixed. Well, no, you'd probably be, you know, you know, lined up against the wall or something and shot, right? And so it's just, I, I think we need to really work to educate people on the fact that yes, democracy looks messy. Yes, you have to accept sometimes you're out of power for a decade and you're going to be pissed off the whole time. Still far better than any of these authoritarian states we're talking. Yeah, and you made a really great point. Can I can I say Spencer made a really great point um, about this? I think Douglas Murray said it best. I, I can't remember how he said it, but you essentially made the point that in terms of this criticism, we we we're, we're we're living in this world where countries that are the most tolerant and open and understanding um, end up being the most criticized because they're like tolerant of the criticism in a way. There's this great thing where he's in Qatar making this point, and then like where they're talking about how racist the UK is, and then he just flips around. And he's like Qatar, your immigration policy. Do you like this? And then like starts going off on them, and then. All the the sheiks there kind of take a, a step back, and he makes this point. Yes, Ben Ben has got a good point that these democracies that allow criticism, which is a good thing. I'm not saying shut it down because we lost our thing, but we have this weird thing where if we want to criticize racism, right, we focus on democracy. Oh, uh, India, like this whole thing, India's racist towards Sikhs and the Sikh uh, plight in India, racism. The Hindus are majority, Sikhs are minority. Okay, but then what about Pakistan, where Sikhs have been nearly slaughtered out of existence? It used to be hundreds of thousands, millions of Sikhs in, in Pakistan. They're now near all gone, murdered, raped. There's there's this cases of, of young Sikh and Hindu girls being kidnapped, raped, forcibly converted into marriage. And the Pakistani Supreme Court 
ruled the judgment and said that this is allowed. So why is there so much criticism from Justin Trudeau on the plight of Sikh suffering in India, a country where Sikhs have risen to the highest positions of power and still hold them, versus Pakistan, a country where all the Sikhs have been slaughtered? So, well, and I think this would be the, one of those moments where I don't think that Justin Trudeau is an economic Marxist, but this is where he gets closest to being a Marxist, is this kind of cultural Marxism uh, where he views the world in terms of oppressor and oppressed, even if a lot of his rules tend to contradict each other once he kind of, you know, keeps, uh, when when he kind of like, when, when you actually look at all of his, the way he kind of like, rules on foreign policy issue to issue he starts to contradict himself but in an, in that isolated situation he always finds out well who's the more put upon one and will either support them or at least ignore everything that they're doing that's bad so that's what whenever like you know israel starts getting bombed by a terrorist group suddenly it becomes a very nuanced issue and we start ignoring all the actual like the the fact that there's a terrorist group against a democracy and that everyone starts calling for a ceasefire even though a ceasefire in a lot of these cases are effectively just a mockery of peace itself, really in the sense that we're just basically saying stop defending yourself, and then we'll hope. Even when they there's reporting on Israel, you look at the maps they use, right? It's always the most zoomed-in map you've ever seen in the world, yeah. right? It's always like, boom, most of Israel, and then a little bit of you know the Palestinian area, and so every other country they talk about it, they do a big map and showing you know the the array of other countries around them, right? But of course, to show that Israel is just a small state with a bunch of you know largely hostile states around them doesn't really fit the narrative that people want to use. And so, yeah. Can, I'll just add to this. There's a literal that. psychological study they did on the Israel thing. I'll let you finish this, where they showed these two different maps. And when Israel's really? they, the same neutral essay on Israel-Palestine conflict, when they showed it on a map of Israel big, Palestine small, most people took Palestinian side. When they showed it on, on a regular scale map of Israel in context of, of, the, of the neighboring regions, most people supported Israel. So it's psychologically valid, this, the, the evidence mm -hmm. what they're saying is out there um, in, in the study. So sorry for, but I just wanted to make Oh, that. I didn't know that, that's cool. Yeah, and so it's just, um, you know, but yeah, this this whole idea of, you know, democracies losing faith in themselves. I mean, it's literally the worst possible moment. And it's, you know, we, you know, you look at artillery shell production, I mean, not to go off on a tangent, but there's no reason that, you know, North Korea should be able to have any kind of impact on the war in, in Ukraine. but. The West has been, I mean, the U.S., I think in, in 1997 or so, 96, somewhere around there, they could produce 840,000 uh, artillery shells, or I think million artillery shells uh, per month. And now it's, no, yeah, 1,000. And now it's 30,000 a month. And this is after them wrapping up production for a year. And so we've just, we've we've been so naive in the West thinking, oh, China's going to just be nice to us. You know, Russia, no, Russia's not angry anymore. They're, they're, they've accepted that they're not an empire anymore. And we've just we've we've been so naive. I mean, you, you look at Canada, right? We can't even defend our own territory. We couldn't even. We were one of like one of the only countries that couldn't even send airplanes to the recent NATO exercise, which included some other NATO air for non-NATO air forces. And so it's it's you know, and maybe we'll get to this. I don't know if there's time, but the the difficulty with which it takes to try to convince Canadians to spend on the military, that people just seem to think it's not necessary or we're never going to need it. I don't know, maybe we can think of some ideas on how to work on that, but it seems like you know, no no party really wants to do much. The conservatives talk a bit about it, they're a little better than others, but even even they're not saying, oh yeah, we're going to wrap up military spending by 20, 30 billion per year. Everyone seems afraid of talking about that. Well, we always spend on, we always just spend on kind of like the kind of like the myth of like shovel ready jobs and whatnot to basically mm -hmm. do make work programs. And if you want a make work program to employ people, but it actually at least helps you know, so like secure the country that of Canada in like in terms of on the foreign, uh, on the international stage and giving us the ability to support allies and giving us the ability to like you know defend the Arctic and be able to have some muscle. At least we would be spending money on something useful. It's not just random, uh, you know, HR jobs and giving a bunch of college students upset that their degrees don't mean anything. A bunch of DEI training positions. But, uh, but another just point I want to make on the democracy thing is, yeah, like when people lose faith in democracy and then they start to think that the entire system's rigged and everything's just against them and whatnot, it leads them to just making dumb decisions when it comes to the development of political movements. This is where I think that the PPC stalled out because they thought they basically accepted after the 2019 election, after they bungled a lot of aspects of it, that, well, we were beat because Warren Kinsella wrote an article on us. And then they ended up not growing the party, not establishing EDAs, and basically just becoming a protest movement where they just show up at different protests. And I, even today at the parents rally, I think I hear a lot of people are upset with them bringing PPC signs when it's just like it wasn't about you guys. And that's really what the party's become. But because they've lost faith in 
democracy in a certain sense. They think that the only way that they're ever going to win is by like some freak breakout moment in a in a protest. When I've talked to many PPC organizers and they'll admit to me that they've never knocked on a single door during an election. But, yeah, it's uh, just yeah, maybe Daniel, I don't know if you want to talk about that. But yeah, it's just it's it's the whole idea of you know people looking for a cheat code. And um, you know, I've noticed with the issues of parental rights as well. There's been a lot of that on the right, unfortunately, where it's like, you know, they people you see people, you know, Putin will give a speech, obviously crafted to appeal to people in North America on this issue. Like he's not an idiot in terms of manipulating people. And so he'll say, Oh, I'm like in the decadent West, you know, we have you know, a mother and a father, not parent one and two, and kid, and people are like, oh, he's not wrong. Well, yeah, Russia's based. Oh, this is great. Yeah, we're so degenerate in the West. And it's like, look, there's protests against it. U.S. states are passing laws against it. People are debating it. Some states and some provinces are going to be more accommodating of what people consider, um, you know, parental rights. Some people consider that, you know, bigoted, whatever. But people, it's a democracy. You're allowed to have your opinion. And the system's working. People are voting, you know, politicians in Canada are responding to people who are concerned about it. You know, they're doing opinion polls. Policy started to change. And so people need to have some faith in, in the democratic system. Yes, you don't always get what you want, but you're never out of it forever. You can change policy. You can convince people. You can persuade people. You can run out elections and things can change. But so many people are just like, oh, no, you know, what? I'll just decide to throw my lot in with a ruthless authoritarian state because maybe it'll give me one or two policies I like because I'm a little bit annoyed at the process of my own country. And it's a very dangerous way of thinking because if, you know, you things really get bad in Canada or there's a big war, we're going to need people to have some faith in, in our democratic system and actually be willing to stand up and fight for it. And right yeah. now, I think there's a bit of a doubt whether that would happen. And just to, yeah. just to point out something to counter this whole trad, uh, trad uh, Russia kind mm -hmm. of narrative, people yes, have to realize yeah. that their abortion yeah. rates have been going exponential over the past several years. Like in just between, I just looked it up, between 2015 and 2019, they increased the number of abortions from like 500,000, 619,000 per year. It is not a country that has like a, that has a low single motherhood rate, rate, let's just put it that way. Uh, but people are very easily like duped by frankly bad propaganda videos and yeah. the thing is when people when people say like i would never be duped like think of all the people duped by justin trudeau it's very possible to get duped yeah i mean yeah that, that that's a good point like spencer's right about that putin's clever enough to undermine the west in sort of the culture war does does putin love american conservatives no like russia's biggest enemy was ronald reagan Right. So so in terms of like cr traditional conservative Western values, um, Putin is a former KGB agent. Um, he is not not a fan of that, but he is very clever and knows how to say things to affect the Western culture. War. And the effect is he wants right wingers in Canada to say, yo, look at Putin. He's so based. So people on the left can be like, aha, all of this is Russia and just destroy our conversation and, and infighting. And he wants the people on our on on one of the side of the political spectrum to be hardcore uh, Russia supporters. It used to be the left. You know, if you watched RT prior to the in, to, to the second invasion of Crimea, it was far left, like whatever, whatever. Maybe a bit, maybe pre-Trump. They changed a bit on Trump with the Russians. If pre-Trump, if you watch RT, it's to the left of the CBC, right? It's it's cultivating hardcore lefties and and that whole cadre into the anti-imperialism, anti-establishment thing. All of a sudden, Trump gets in, and now Trump's the anti-Russia guy. So they, they have this more like sort of no. Now we're kind of based, right? So there's no consistency here. Spencer, it's just the yeah. Russians doing pro foreign propaganda. The people who used to cite Sputnik and RT and all these people the most were like the progressives over at the Young they Turks. They have the Ukraine the... flag in their bio. Is it someone yeah, who it was, a Sputnik it was, it article? Was and... Like the Young Turks, it's people yeah. like Jimmy Dore. They would literally have them on their shows and talk about how you no, know, Bashar al-Assad didn't actually gas a bunch of people, despite all the evidence. They just happened to have a budget bigger than every themselves. Hollywood movie made that year to be able to stage a gas attack. <laughs> Yeah, and hire child actors from from the from Syria to get gassed. Yeah, classic, classic, uh, classic deep statery. Um, you know, you have there. And, oh, yeah, so that's another annoying one. I hate when people just take clips from movies that are obviously from movies and pretending that they were staging some sort of like oh, that, crisis yeah. event in Ukraine or whatever. They're like, look, they're pretending people are running down the street scared. I'm like, it's a British indie movie. You can see Big Ben in the background. What are you talking about? Yeah. And do you think like who would be? Yeah, it's 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 all so stupid. I mean, didn't we like? There's a tweet that I remember going viral like a couple months ago of like, has anyone even seen any footage of the war in Ukraine? And this is like eight months in, and like lots of footage there, and like three thousand retweets. And you're like, 
these three three thousand people or likes like whoever whoever liked this tweet like needs to be put in, it needs to be institutionalized right now like great jacket padded room like it, we need these people off the streets like it, the same people wearing two masks outside someone wearing two masks outside needs to share a, a, a mental institution cell with someone who thinks there's no war footage of ukraine and this is how we are going to solve the country is putting those two idiots in a room until they either merge and become normal or both uh, dive in anyway. well that sounds like a fantastic time to end off this uh first sort of like a pre-recorded podcast that we're doing with guests but uh, maybe, uh, Spencer, do you want to maybe like let people know where they can find your work? I, I highly endorse people read Spencer, the Spencer Fernando's blog. Yeah, yeah. Go to SpencerFernando.com and uh, NationalCitizens.ca or follow me on Twitter at Spencer Fernando. I'm going to be writing, uh, I think today, probably about why it's a moral and strategic imperative for uh, the West and Canada to support Ukraine. So I'm sure I'll lose some followers over that one and piss some more people off. But that's part of the fun. Well, yeah, I, to, to, to extend my endorsement a little bit, I think that you're probably one of the people who puts out pretty much everything that you need to know in terms of Canadian politics. You're, you're just one guy, and you put out three or four articles in a day of every breaking story that they need to know with enough detail that they actually can talk about it at like a family dinner, and they're not going to look dumb. Because the, that's the funny thing about mainstream media in Canada is that like a lot of the stuff you're you're like it's people being paid say you dollars. click on a spent you click on something on spencer's uh website you get more than just what the title is which yeah is but like more than you can CBC, say about a lot of people. the cbc it's an eight someone being paid eighty thousand dollars a year to put out two articles every other day about like some random thing that happened in kitchener it, it's ridiculous but anyways thanks for coming on spencer this has been great thanks to you for daniel for for showing up from your big uh from your big Bollywood, uh, tour. yeah yeah from your big bollywood <laughs> tour in india bollywood over Calistanis. Anyways, well, that should be enough for us today and uh, have a great day, everyone.